Hello and welcome viewers to a new season and another essential episode of A Different Kind of Woman. A Different Kind of Woman is supportive. There are over 1.2 million stroke survivors in the UK. Stroke affects everybody differently. Many stroke survivors continue to improve over a long time, sometimes over a number of years. On today's show, Stroke Strategy, we are going to discuss the process of recovering from a stroke and much more. Joining me to discuss the topic is medicinal and food and cookery expert, Shahina Ali. Welcome, Shahina. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so this topic of stroke is something that really connects with a lot of people. Absolutely, it affects so many people these yes. days. Younger generations as well as older generations. Yes, and so younger and younger yeah. people uh, uh, coming down, you know, with having been affected, um, by, stroke. affected totally. by stroke or a family member. Totally, it's, it's a lot of it is um, lifestyle based, but also hereditary as well. So yes. a lot of people are susceptible to it. So they're prone to having stroke okay. um, anytime during their later life, half of their life, as well as um, slightly earlier on in their thirties. Uh, depending on what they've had in terms of medication, as well as their lifestyle, what they're eating. Yeah, it's um, a lot of a lot of factors exactly, that can contribute stress as well. Stress. <laughs> yes, the big topic: stress. I've been to hospital and I've seen you know people in their twenties, thirties. Yes, I think it's who have suffered from a stroke. Exactly, it's, it's quite surprising how mm. many people are being affected in their thirties these days. And it's a case where it's not just because of the level of salt in the diet, but it's also exercise as well, yes. um, birth control as well, uh, women may be taking that might mm. affect them and make them more prone to a stroke. Yes. And, um, you know, there are things that can be done that basically to minimize the susceptibility of stroke or having mm. stroke later in life. So how can we help our viewers? Especially with a low cholesterol diet. Yes, well, there's a lot of um, uh, things that can be done to minimise your, um, you know, being prone to stroke, mm -hmm. whether it's earlier on in, the, in your life or, or later on. Yeah. And um, main aspects are the main things are diet and exercise yeah. and reducing stress. Mm -hmm. Now, the other factors that can be looked at are the medications you're taking. Um, yeah. Such as birth control, it's very commonplace nowadays for women yeah. to be affected by that as well. Yeah. Um, they're affected by DVT, deep vein thrombosis, which is blood clotting, mm -hmm. um, which can be really a you know a prior factor that can lead to stroke later in. Wow, because many times we take medication, but sometimes we don't really pay attention to the side effects. No, exactly, you know. exactly, and it's really important to try and make yourself aware about the side effects and what, can, what you can do to minimise those as well. Yes, so for low cholesterol, we hear that so often, what kind of foods can we uh, recommend to um, our viewers that well, they, can, they can have? It's really a case of looking at, um, there, you know, there's different types of cholesterol in yes. the diet, there's LDL cholesterol and there's HDL cholesterol. Now, okay, LDL, break that down for us. LDL <laughs> cholesterol is normally looked at as the bad cholesterol. Okay. Um, but it is necessary in your diet in small case, in smaller amounts as well. Okay. But um, we're looking for HDL, which is high um, density lipoprotein, which is the good cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And foods such as avocados contain that as well. Love avocados. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> necessary to, you know, try and have avocado in your diet if you can. Um, mm -hmm. There's also other things that you can have, not just cholesterol based, but Foods such as beetroot, which actually open wider your um, blood vessels. There yes. is a, a chemical beetroot is in that. really good for yeah. you. You can boil it. You could even have it in a salad. Exactly. exactly. There are lots of ways you can prepare it. In soup as well. And um, I've never had that one though. <laughs> beetroot soup. <laughs> no. It can be added in, and so it is lovely, and it adds a bit of colour to your food as well. Oh. So natural colour. And uh, yes. yeah, so that really um, helps your blood vessels to open slightly wider. Before we go further into today's topic, let's get the facts and the chats from the streets of London. There are more than 100,000 strokes in the UK each year. That is around one stroke every five minutes. Someone in the world has a stroke every two seconds. Like all organs, the brain needs oxygen and nutrients provided by the blood to function properly. If the supply of blood is restricted or stopped, brain cells begin to die. This can lead to brain injury, disability, and possibly death. 
health conditions that increase the risk of stroke are high blood pressure, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, a heart condition that causes irregular heart rates, sickle cell anemia, and high cholesterol. You can significantly reduce your risk of having a stroke through leading a healthy lifestyle by eating a healthy diet, taking regular exercise, drinking alcohol in moderation, and not smoking. Strokes are usually treated with medication, but in some cases, surgery may also be required. The main symptoms for stroke can be remembered with the word fast. Face. The face may have dropped on one side. The person may not be able to smile, or their mouth or eye may have dropped. Arms. The person suspected of a stroke may not be able to lift both arms and keep them there because of weakness or numbness in one arm. Speech. Their speech may be slurred or garbled, or the person may not be able to talk at all despite appearing to be awake. Time. It's time to dial 999 immediately if you see any of these signs or symptoms. Stroke is the leading cause of disability in the UK. Almost two-thirds of stroke survivors in the UK leave hospital with a disability. Only two out of ten stroke survivors who need assessment of their health and social care needs receive one. Around half of stroke survivors require speech and language therapy after or during their hospital stay in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Common side effects post-stroke are fatigue, depression, problems swallowing, higher risk of pneumonia, loss of bladder and bowel control, and difficulty controlling emotions. The NHS and social care costs of stroke are around 1.7 billion a year in England. My ability to communicate, because as long as I can communicate with those I love, I'm as happy as I can ever be. So as long as I can talk to the ones I love, I'm very happy with my life. It doesn't matter if I can move or not, so as long as they know that I love them, I can tell them. Uh, probably for mine would be mobility, I think. If you can't really get up and move around, can't really do anything. Um, but other people would have different views on that, I suppose. Uh, I think for me to be communication. It would be really hard to go through the whole day and not be able to communicate what you want or what you're thinking or uh, how you feel. And I'm uh, also thinking that communicate as well. You know, uh, it's very important, I think, to communicate and speak. I think my ability to communicate more than anything, it would just be really frustrating and really disheartening to not be able to um, express yourself or communicate properly with people. I think that I find that most frustrating more than anything. I like walking around, I'm quite active, so uh, I'll know, at least my legs, that wouldn't be okay with me. But then again, thinking about my family, they wouldn't want to see me sort of you know, unable to communicate with them. So, I don't know, it's a tough question, but I'd say I wouldn't want to lose my legs. I'd want to be, you know, unable to speak and stuff like that. Although the biggest steps in recovery are usually in the first few weeks after a stroke, the brain's ability to rewire itself, known as neuroplasticity, means that it is possible to improve for months or years afterwards. More people are surviving strokes than ever before. There are over 1.2 million stroke survivors in the UK alone. That discussion really um, makes you think, would you prefer to lose your mobility? That's a very or... hard question, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. very hard to decide between the two. Yeah, because disability, um, due to stroke, a lot of people in the UK uh, are disabled because yes. of, you know, having uh, the experience of a stroke. Yes, so, that's right. And it, most of the times it leaves them where they, they can't speak, their, speaks, their speech rather is interrupted, or their, their physical, you know, uh, ability to move yes, and do things, or, you know, they're independent. Exactly. Um, independence rather. So it's, it's, it really makes you think because everything is related. The way how we eat, what we eat, mm. you know, how we treat our bodies. Yes, I think it's really, really important to look at how... Um, you know, not just a low cholesterol aspect, yeah. but um, level of stress you're under as well. Mm. And, and today we can't run you. away from it because we are living busy lives. Exactly, exactly. So but we're le leading busy lives, but we're very, very desk bound a lot yeah. of the time, or we're you know sitting down a lot and not moving as much as we yes, used to yes. um, years ago. 
And also the fact is that looking at cholesterol, just going back to that again, mm -hmm. it's not really the cholesterol that's a huge issue. It's actually the level of sugar in your diet and salt in your diet that is really, really important. I knew it, Sheena. Yeah, exactly. I knew it. It's the salt and the sugar. That's right. Because um, <laughs> the cholesterol is there as a repair mm. mechanism. So it's there to repair your blood vessels. Yeah. So really, if you reduce the sugar and salt in your diet, Mm. then the level of cholesterol really is not going but to be But is it true that they said that the men intake should be more for, Sorry, for salt? The, the salt. As um, opposed men. to women? Yeah, because really when you're perspiring, when you're sweating, mm -hmm. you actually release a lot of the salt from your body. Yeah. So if you're exercising a lot, for example, or if you're in a really, really hot climate, then it is fine to take a little bit of extra salt, but not in excess, you know. But salt um, isn't like in everything. It's true, but men, men also perspire a little bit more, so they're absolutely fine to take a little bit more salt, mm. but not huge amounts. And we are taking yeah. a lot more than necessary. I think it's also changing like the way how we prepare our meals. Yeah. Because if you have like seasoning, those powder seasoning, or the yeah, cubes and different things that we Everything use. Everything contains salt, right? But yes. you can make your own seasoning. And I think really, really um, good to look at would be to make your own herbal seasoning. Yes. Because when herbs are dry, they, they taste a bit salty themselves anyway. Yes, naturally, yeah. yeah. I don't have any salt. Do you and not? my food is fine. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> my food is great. It's a rarity. It's not really, really commonplace to have no salt, salt in your diet. Yeah, but it's fine for me. Yeah. For other people, they might think I would need more salt, more seasoning. Yeah. You know? Your taste buds become accustomed to salt yes. diet as well. I, and now that I've cut down on salt, mm. I taste salt in everything. Yeah, that's true. I find everything is salty. Yeah, I think it's a lot of um, added salt, which is not necessary, but people also automatically add salt on, on the table and, you know, say so table salt while they're dining. Yeah. And they don't need to do that. That's before they've even tasted the meal. Exactly. They're already so started habit. sprinkling uh, salt on their food. So. Exactly. So what is your meal like? My meal is more um, really a lot of herbs, so they, mm. they add a bit more flavour and salt and seasoning to the meal anyway. Yeah. Um, but also, I like to have dried herbs, which taste quite salty themselves, mm. and also add lemon juice or lime juice. Um, and I think that's really, really key to giving a bit more zest to the, and flavour to the meal. And you don't okay. need to have any more added salt after that. Yes, yes. So like for breakfast, what would you recommend for our viewers that they can have for um, breakfast or lunch? Well, dinner? it really depends on what kind of lifestyle you lead as well. And mm -hmm. also um, if you're a certain age group. So if you're leading a really busy lifestyle, yeah. I would definitely add more protein in the breakfast. Like? So eggs, for example. Yeah. Um, and also something such as a, a, you know, a slow releasing carbohydrate like oats. So I porridge. love oats porridge. Yeah, with a bit of fresh fruit, or even um, protein-wise, if you don't have eggs, then fresh yogurt or Greek yogurt okay. with um, fresh fruits as well. Yeah, berries, and a bit of honey. Exactly. banana. It's absolutely gorgeous in the yes. morning as well, especially in the summer. Oh, I could eat it every day. <laughs> and for lunch, I do love a salmon. Yeah, salmon is absolutely amazing for your mm -hmm. body because it has so many good fats in there. So but is there was, such a thing you can eat too much? <laughs> I don't think there is too much salmon you can eat, but you have to be aware that, um, you know, it's wild caught salmon as well. It's not uh, farm salmon. Um, there seems to be a lot of mercury in uh, some fish as well that are not really wild caught salmon. Okay. So I think it's really key to look at those um, sources, where provenance, basically where it originates from, okay. where you're getting the food from. We're going to take a short break, but stay tuned and take a look at what's next. Next, Anita Froster, real life stroke survivor, will join us in the studio. When she phoned me, I was actually suffering the stroke at the time. So, um, wow. yeah, I was lying on the floor. Welcome back on today's show, Stroke Strategy. We've been discussing a healthy diet. Joining us in the studio is stroke survivor, Anita Froster. Welcome, Anita, to the Thank studio. You. Thank you. Oh, it's so good to have you to share your story with our viewers. <laughs> so tell us, when did this happen? When did you have a stroke? Um, I suffered the stroke 17 years ago, um, the day before my 25th birthday. So, oh, wow. um, that yeah. Young. Did you That's realize? Young, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you realize it was a stroke at the time? Um, well, basically, it was my birthday on the Monday. Mm -hmm. I suffered the stroke the day before on the Sunday, and I went out to celebrate my birthday on the Saturday. So, my sister came down to London 
my sister lives up in Hull. So when she came down to London, I celebrated it in, in a club. And then the next day, um, I said to my sister, can you please phone me um, as soon as you get back to Hull? Because obviously my birthday's in November and it was like a really windy day. Yeah. And um, when she phoned me, I was actually suffering the stroke at the time. Oh, wow. So um, wow. yeah, I was lying on the floor. Um, yeah, and all that I was thinking, because at the time I lived in a bed sit. Yeah. So um, my, my, my bedroom door was locked. So um, I was thinking that there's no way that anyone would know that I'm at home. Yes. So um, basically I was, um, I, I um, pulled the receiver off the, um, the, the handset mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I spoke to my sister. And obviously um, all that I could say was, um, mm, 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 sort of thing yeah. and she obviously then she knew that there was something, something wrong, wrong. Yeah. wow so she was the one that called the ambulance um yeah basically she phoned the police first okay and um because it was um bonfire night on the sunday and obviously people had gone out to celebrate bonfire night on the saturday they um they, they had like a few um um what's it called um so the, so the police well, they were very busy on that night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it took them a while to get to my house and obviously yeah. they couldn't knock my door down. So the um, fire brigade had to come oh, and then wow. they, they knocked my door down oh, and then the ambulance arrived. So yeah. So it took some that time. Was quite an ordeal, yeah. 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 So what was your recovery process like? Um, well, basically, I was taken to Barnet Hospital and um, obviously at the time I, I didn't know what was going on yes. um, and the, the ambulance person spoke to me and he said, um, he just asked me like, normal questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your name and stuff like that yeah. and I, I thought that I was answering him perfectly normally but all that I was saying was, mm, mm, do you know what I mean and obviously my my face had been pulled down and it, yeah okay. so so in your mind you thought that you were answering perfectly normal yeah 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 oh wow yeah so and how long did you stay in hospital i stayed um i stayed in barnet hospital for a week and then okay. i stayed and um, my dad's um well i was a retired gp but at the time it was a gp okay. so um he him up here my mum came down to london and um he um so basically I, I i went back to burton on trent which is where they're from to mm -hmm. uh, spend two weeks in burton on trent hospital mm -hmm. okay. and then um i came back home to, to, to my parents house yeah. did they explain to you at the time what happened did they explain that it was a stroke that um, you experienced yes but at the time i didn't realize what was what going is a stroke yeah, yeah yeah so yeah, because you're thinking, I'm young, you know, I just, yeah, exactly. my birthday. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, there was, no, yeah, there was no way place. that I was thinking that I would ever suffer a stroke at such a young age. So. Is there a family history of stroke? No. Okay. No. Did, they, did they tell you what caused it? What, what they led? said that I'd had it because I was on the, um, the pill, the conservative pill. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. I think so how, how are you today? How have you... Um, recovered since? Um, well, for, for 10 years, I kind of denied that I've suffered a stroke and I tried to, mm -hmm. because I, I used to be a producer. And um, so basically I went back to my job. Um, I, I spent, spent four months out of work and then came back down to London. Okay. And I went back to being a producer, but a bit of a lower position position just to build myself up mm. to being a producer again yeah. and I really couldn't do it because obviously I couldn't speak really yeah. um, speaking listening reading and writing up that those four things have completely gone wow. really yeah at the so time like, was starting all over again yeah yeah I had to teach myself how to speak again and mm. yeah it was very very frustrating and stuff like that yeah but what about the movement and walking and stuff did it affect you Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, so um, basically, I can't really write anymore um, because I suffered my stroke on the left side of my brain, so it affected the whole of my right side. So um, yeah, so that that was pretty hard. I mean, at the moment, I can write 
cars so it's you know like send a like a card to, to a friend or whatever but it would take me like 20 minutes to write the card and that is really frustrating for me because I've got an English lit degree and yeah. you know I've got mm. an English lit A level and obviously A level I've always writing 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 but now obviously I can't do that but you know it's okay because yes. now I've, um, I've used laptops all the time mm. now and stuff so like you're that. typing yeah you're able to type yeah yeah okay yeah okay so it's, it's it's okay it's okay yeah yes yes so life is a little bit you can say in some ways it's normal it's gone back to you know your your regular schedule where you go to work and well, yeah i mean t to be honest though it was only um last year that mm -hmm. i got my I spent a lot, lot of time denying that I'd suffered a stroke and trying yeah. to get back into my old life and stuff like that. And um, it was only, yeah, I've been seeing counsellors and stuff like that. And okay. it was only like seven, seven and a half years ago when I met my husband, he, um, he actually said to me, I think you need a bit, a bit of help really, yes. because yeah. he'd, he'd seen what I'd been through and also the fact that I hadn't got any help really mm. at yes. all. I hadn't You've not had any re rehabilitation from hospitals? No, then? no. I'd, I'd gone for physio initially and counselling initially, but obviously when, when you can't speak, mm. it's, yeah. it's a bit pointless really. I, I, I think it is sort of thing. I mean, obviously I, I tried, but um, I found that the counsellor was very dismissive with me and stuff like yeah. that. So. But it's okay, yeah. you know. But last year, um, I saw an amazing, amazing counsellor who completely transformed my life, actually. That's good. Yes. Yeah. I think the, the, the counselling, you know, and, and, and did you have physiotherapy? Yeah, I had physio and speech therapy and yes. um, asphasia. Basically, I went to... What um, is asphasia? Um, asphasia is mm -hmm. when you you know what you're going to say it's all yes. up in your head mm -hmm. yes. but you can't, can't say it come out and it's so. it's really difficult mm -hmm. it's um so basically um when i suffered the stroke um i i couldn't speak mm -hmm. and although i knew what was going on in my head i couldn't speak and that yes. was so frustrating because obviously the doctors they, they spoke to me like well like i was a vegetable really which Mm. That's quite shocking, isn't it? To have yeah, but it was a long time ago, though. Yeah. I think things have improved. Yeah, since it's, then. it's been a process, a yeah. continuous process. Yeah. You know, because when you're first, you know, told that you know you had a stroke, you know, it's it's getting that information. It's trying to overcome that. Yeah. Area. And then, you know, you realise, OK, I can't do things that I yeah. would find usually easy to do. Mm. So it's like starting all over again. Yeah. And then once you overcome bit by bit, you know, your confidence grows as well. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. I, I remember on the first day that they were showing me pictures of things and showed me a picture of a table and I'd say it was a kettle. They showed me a picture of a chair and I'd say, I don't know, it was to do what I mean. I'd yeah. completely mm. get the words mixed up oh, in my he in head. And obviously I could see my parents, my sister say, oh, do what I mean. It was so... Yeah. They were so gutted that I couldn't get that right or whatever, but, yeah. you know, and I, I got frustrated because I, you know, but... Yeah, I think they're willing you to say the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just not coming out correctly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of people find it very frustrating, especially after a stroke, but also they're prone to getting depression because of it. So yeah, yeah. And to have mm. the support system around you is really It's vital. really important. Professional yes. as well as family support. Yes. Yeah. Having your family support and your husband's support mm. and professional support. Exactly. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Mm. But especially... Um, um, five years ago, I joined in this um, um, aphasia class, right. and it was okay. I've just left it actually this year. But I went there for five years, and that class mm. was just the most amazing thing that I've ever done in my whole life um, after my stroke, sort of thing, because it really get, got my confidence back yeah. as well, which is what I really needed really was it a one-to-one -one or a group session it was a group session yeah okay, but so you met with other other uh, people who um, yeah, experienced stroke. yeah okay. so basically they either had suffered a stroke or they had suffered a brain injury is this a national mm. organization um yeah it was in um, covent garden 
Okay. Yeah. The national organisation, is it throughout the country as well, so other people can access it? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, that, that, that particular class was in City Lit. Right, okay. So, so um, it was so helpful for other people, because if they're not getting the, um, say, for example, a counsellor that they can't relate to, mm. like you, the initial counsellor that you had, they'll find it very, they have a defeatist attitude to it and they won't want to go forward and you know, try yes, anyone else. But yeah. I think that would be fantastic for anyone else to try. Yeah, so basically I got so much confidence from um, joining this um, Aspasia class, yeah. Mm. And um, the first presentation I had it all written down on a piece of paper and I was really, really nervous and I was reading it like, you know, word by word or whatever. And um, the final presentation I did fi um, th this year, mm. I um, didn't have any pa pieces of paper at all. Wow. That's brilliant progress. Yeah. That's a great That's achievement. Really so yeah. you, you look healthy. You, Thank you. You, <laughs> <laughs> you Thank seem you. to be living a, a full and active life now. Yes. Uh, so yeah. what are your hopes for the future? Well, at the moment, this year, actually, um, in December time, I was thinking, what could I do and get get something out there about my stroke but also mm. so basically I've d done an Instagram and a Twitter page from the 1st of January right so um, basically um, it's not all about the stroke but um, I've got like 80 stroke survivors following me on Instagram and yeah. over a thousand because so you're inspiring you're, you're you're empowering other people exactly. you know yeah because I've known many people who've had strokes but none of them has recovered the way you have you know, in terms of you're able to, to still be active and, and do so much. Yeah, but it's been a hard mm. battle, though. I think it's yes. important to show people that it can be done. Of course. And you are leading of a, a more full life. Yeah. Whereas yes. people might think, oh, they've had a stroke and they can't lead a full life. Yeah. yeah. It can be done with a bit of effort. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. So, a lot of effort. Exactly. Yeah, a lot, exactly. of, a lot of effort, yeah. Yeah. So um, on Instagram, it's a Anita Wan Foster, if anyone wants to follow me. That's and brilliant. on Twitter, mm -hmm. it's a... Anita Foster, 74. Oh, thank so, you so much for sharing your story yeah, with us, okay. Anita. It's been truly inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, I will definitely add you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. Take a look at the interesting woman that will be joining us after the break. Next, we'll be hearing about the latest medical breakthrough in stroke medicine with Dr. Bhavani Patel and health blogger Pommy Knight will be joining us in the studio. When we, it does happen, you know really what to do and how to act. You need to act mm -hmm. fast. Welcome back on today's show, Stroke Strategy. We've been hearing from real life survivor, Anita Froster. Our team met with Dr. Bavini Patel to find out about the latest medical breakthrough in stroke medicine. Let's hear what she had to say. I first of all became interested in the world of neurology um, in my second year of medical school when we first started doing our neurosciences module. And for the first time, everything clicked. Um, that you had a map, which was the brain and the spinal cord, and you could actually find out where in the brain or in the map the problem is just by looking at the patient. And that intrigued me as to how um, one maps the other and, and you can follow and figure out where the problem is. And then as time developed and I started to learn more about it, you then understood all the different myriad of pathologies that can happen within this one organ. Within the actual work field, I'm someone who likes um, quick results. I'm someone who likes to think very much on the spot. Um, I kind of like to be under pressure. So as time went on, I then was able to come to St George's um, to do one of my junior doctor jobs and pretty much that was all in stroke and neurology. And that is when it all came together, where I was able to do neurology, figure out the brain, the map, what's wrong with the patient. But at the same time, we have to make time orientated quick decisions in order to get the best out of the patient and get the best results for them. And at the same time, you had a great team to work with. You had nurses, you had junior doctors, you had therapists, A&E departments, everybody working together to try and help this one person as quickly as possible because time was very important for a patient with a stroke. All in all, it provided everything that I wanted from an exciting career that's hopefully um, gonna keep improving with all the developments that are happening. 
So immediately after the hullabaloo of uh, providing the treatment and getting the people on the ward, or even for the patients who haven't had haven't come in within the time frame to have any of these other treatments, the mainstay is then keeping them medically stable initially. So it's the change in the brain, keeping their blood pressures nice and stable. So in the immediate aftermath of having had a stroke, it's very important to look at any other medical problems that may happen, so chest infections, um, keeping them nourished, but ne not necessarily overnourished. We have to make sure that they can eat and drink um, and not aspirate, i.e. not let the food go into their lungs. Um, nursing, so turning and looking after their general nursing needs. Um, and then when things are a little bit on the calmer side, it's trying to look at the recovery and the rehabilitation. Um, there has been a lot of work um, so far, which has shown that you probably need to start or well, you're safe to start rehabilitation from about 24 hours on after a big stroke. But for each person, it has to be individual and graded because big strokes need slightly slower rehab initially and smaller strokes you can probably push a little bit harder uh, and that's where the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, speech and language therapist come in. The other things from the medical side is obviously prevention. Um, so once you've had the stroke, it's our job then to figure out why you've had a stroke and how we prevent another one from happening. Um, so whether that's looking at the heart or other blood vessels and, and then trying to treat that and or reduce the risk of having another one by looking at that. So it's, it's both a medical and a rehabilitation side. Um, most strokes, um, which can be discharged are nowadays um, discharged home with rehabilitation getting in as early as possible at home and that's something we call early supportive discharge. Strokes that stay within a hospital once they've dealt with the hyperacute side so all this um, tr early treatment that we give once all that has settled down after about 72 hours or so they ideally then go more towards a stroke unit bed where there's a little bit more rehab available so they get a little bit more time every day with the therapists rather than the doctors just to rebalance it all. And once all of that is stable and it feels like they need a lot more rehabilitation time then they may be referred for longer term rehabilitation. Um, all of these things are goal directed per person so it requires a lot of effort from the multidisciplinary team so there's usually a physiotherapist, a speech and language therapist, could be a psychologist, an occupational therapist and the nursing team so all of them plus the medics kind of have to plan what they think the patient is going to achieve and then set a goal for the patient to try and reach to each time so it's not something that you can roll out to everybody as a program. It is an individual approach that has to be done in rehab. So I started working in 2004 and the breakthroughs that have come through from there have been um, twofold really. I qualified in 2004 from medical school and at that time nobody really was that interested in stroke medicine. Um, it was felt like an incurable condition. There wasn't really much um, effort and funding that had gone into stroke care. Um, there wasn't really much emphasis in, in the secondary prevention side very much either. Some centres were doing it, but it wasn't a big national thing. Um, and then when I started at St George's, I realised actually, not only in this centre, but throughout the country, things are changing. And the things that had changed at the time was um, a drug called Alteplase, which is now the mainstay treatment of um, all clots in brains and um, within a certain amount of time, so within four and a half hours, which are there for people who've come in with a stroke and you could give this drug and it helps if given early enough, one in eight people. Um, and obviously being physicians, we weren't satisfied that only one in eight were improving and there were a large amount of people that we weren't able to help because the clots were too big. And so the evidence um, came through in 2015 to use um, technology to pull out clots um, and then we became the first centre to provide this service 24 hours about a year and a bit ago um, where we're able to actually help one in five people who have had very big strokes um, and by just pulling out their clot as long as they get to us within again a very short time space window of six hours um, but again the sooner the better so there's a lot of developments that have happened but all this stuff has happened in the past five to six years where it's revolutionized how people manage patients with stroke. There's a lot more interest now because it's not an incurable condition. You can do something about it um, as the stroke is happening. Um, and that is actually getting a lot more people interested in talking about it. It's amazing what medical science can do these days. Joining us in the studio is health blogger, 
Pommy Knight. Welcome to the studio once again. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, welcome back. So you told us the other week about your father. Mm -hmm. He had a stroke um, causing, you know, heart disease. We spoke about heart disease on our previous um, show. So tell us um, more about your involvement in, um, in this field. Well, when my dad had his stroke, mm -hmm. um, like I stated last week on the show, um, I was still in training. However, due to the vast amount of knowledge that I had on hand, it yeah. really did help me to liaise with his doctors. You know, I was involved, like I said, with his scans, test his results. care plan. Yes, mm. with the care plan, medicine management. Um, also to do with his diet, because he couldn't really eat. He had swallowing difficulties, couldn't really move. There was really quite a lot mm -hmm. to handle. But yeah. um, with the knowledge that I had, um, we were able to put everything all together Yes. You know, just to make his life a bit more, you know, comfortable. Yes. Uh, health is like a big issue mm -hmm. that plays, you know, when we, when we become victim of, of a stroke yeah. or any sort of heart um, disease. Um, what can you tell our viewers what they would need to do to help prevent this from happening? Well, to start with, I think we all need to look at our lifestyle. Yeah. We also need to know about the risk factors that, are, mm -hmm. that is actually associated with stroke. Secondly, we have to really be aware of the signs, you know, and symptoms yes. of stroke. Yes. So that when we, it does happen, you know really what to do and how to act. You need to act mm -hmm. fast. Yeah, you really know? quickly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because um, there is a lot of, you know, I mean, last, was it 2015 slash 16? Mm -hmm. You will not believe, Alifa, that a third of the people who went into hospital with stroke actually did not even know when their symptoms started. Okay. Which is really quite sad. So the public actually being made aware of the fast test that would help them to be able to identify these signs. Shahina, mm -hmm. you spoke about this as well in, in one of our earlier programs as well, uh, about you know the health situation and what we can do to help prevent or improve our lives. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What, what can we do? Um, because we know, yes, our health, what we eat has a part to play. But what yeah. else can our viewers do to prevent this from happening? Uh, a big uh, part of stroke as well is also stress. So obviously, um, probably knows about the fact that mm -hmm. stress plays a huge part in contributing to anyone being prone to, stro to stroke. Yeah. And um, reducing stress by exercise, that has a double whammy effect in terms of keeping your heart healthy, your blood flow going as well. And stops any sort of uh, DVT or anything like that that's also mm. contributed to stress. But everyone deals with stress differently. Some people don't even recognize the stress. There's like stress, I don't have no yeah. stress. Yeah, <laughs> they become so accustomed to it, they don't realize they've got the stress in their life. Yeah. And I think it's really important to take a little bit of time out just to step back and see what your lifestyle is like. Yeah. And what can, what can you do in terms of small adjustments that you can make on a daily basis? Um, a little bit more sleep, for example, a little bit more mm -hmm. exercise. That can actually reduce sleep. stress. Exercise. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. So definitely. not only just what you're eating, but mm -hmm. also lifestyle it plays a big, big factor. Because Anita is joining us. She had a stroke. Okay. Eh? And, um, you know, today she's living an active and healthy life. So, so for you, sleep is very important. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, even last month, um, there, there was a couple of occasions that, that I didn't get enough sleep. Yeah. And um, yeah, the next day my, my aphasia was quite bad actually. And that made me more frustrated really because yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I wanted to say stuff and I couldn't say, you know. It didn't come out. Yeah, really. exactly, exactly. Wow. So. Are you able to like exercise? Yeah, actually, um, I ran a, a 10K um, run the, a couple of years ago and it finished yeah, up in the Olympic cool. Stadium. Wow. Oh, wow. And although I was probably the last, the second to last person to finish, mm -hmm. and just considering, you know, there was loads and loads of thousands of people running it. Yeah. And, you know, I've walked, I walked a lot, you know, I walked a lot and mm -hmm. um, practically, the only, the, the only, I ran around the Olympic Stadium, that was the only part of the, the running that I did really sort of thing but I, yeah you did well yeah I feel yeah. quite quite impressed actually that I did it well, sort of thing. yeah wow <laughs> yeah you really know the happy. last time you were on I said I'm going to do more exercising yes you did <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to I it's have the bike I have mm, the indoor bike 
Lovely. <laughs> so I'm going to do some work at home and I advise our viewers to, to get active. Don't let the weather, you know, because very often we find, oh, it's cold, it's dark, it's Those this, excuses. it's that. Yeah. Always right? some sort of excuse. But we have to eat healthy, but we also yes. have to exercise, take care of our bodies, yeah. our health, mentally and physically. You take responsibility for your health. Of course. Mm -hmm. Your body will take care of you after that. It's so true. And if you do it now, while we're young. Exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we live preparing healthier. Way. Yeah. Yes, yes. For the future. Okay. So we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. We'll be back with more on stroke strategy. Here's a sneak peek of what's coming up after the break. Next, we learn how to hula with lady exercise. Pooping is one of the most effective things you can do to tone rectus abdominis front stomach muscles. Welcome back on today's topic, stroke strategy. Before the break, we were discussing how exercise can reduce our risk of strokes and speed up recovery. To demonstrate some fun exercise, Lady Exercise shows us how to hula. Hello, I'm Nana Aquir, AKA Lady Exercise, and today I'm gonna to show you how to hula. Okay, now hooping is one of the most effective things you can do to tone rectus abdominis front stomach muscles, also to help with support of your back and it's great cardiovascular exercise as well. So that's fabulous. Right, okay, so first things first, you've got your hoop. I like these ones, they're slightly weighted. Heavier the hoop, the more aerobic the workout. Okay, you can have a lightweight hoop, but the lighter the hoop, the harder to rotate. Believe me, that is how it works. All right, so I'm gonna step inside my hoop. Make sure the hoop is in contact with my lower back. Yep. It's amazing how many grown adults I see going, it's not working. No, of course it's not. <laughs> right, so make sure the hoop is touching your lower back. Okay, one foot in front of the other. Okay, make sure one foot's in front of the other. The foot forward in the direction you're turning the hoop. So if you're spinning to the left, the left foot is forward. If you're going to the right, the right foot is forward. Okay, bend your knees, roll your shoulder blades back, brace your abdominal muscles, then push your hoop, give it an almighty shove, and your movement is forward and back. Avoid hip rotation, that's bad for the knees. If you rotate your hips, it means your knees will be rolling on the balls, and you don't want that to happen. You wanna be pushing forward a natural movement. And if you do this, you can do this for about 15 minutes a day, five days a week. Now, the big secret with hooping is you're going in one direction, catch the hoop, make sure you also hoop in the opposite direction. You might find that it's actually harder one way around, it's up to you. Now you can, can add bits to your hooping exercise, you can add some arm exercises, you can do all sorts of things, and you can even add a spin. Catch your hoop, change direction. I like to hoop seven and a half minutes one way, seven and a half minutes the other. Ta -da! So that's how you hula. And it's great for cardiovascular fitness, which is heart and lungs. Back to you in the studio. So ladies, the problem with exercise is that, you know, it's monotonous, it's boring, but you know, I don't see it as much fun. Do you? I think it's important to have variety. Yeah, I know what you're yes. saying. We need to have balance, we need to have yeah. do different things. Yeah. What do you do? I think it's really important for me to have variety in particular because I have a very low boredom threshold. Yes. So I do <laughs> boxing occasionally. Oh, wow. Which is really great for your cardio, mm -hmm. you know, cardiovascular system, gets your heart pumping. Yes. And, uh, and it, you also learn something You don't well. strike me as a boxer. No. <laughs> I, I love it, in fact. I really love it. So that's something that I do. But also, on top of that, um, there are other things like Krav Maga, which is another self-defense form. What? Krav Maga. Okay. Um, which I think is excellent because you use your legs more than your arms as well. So Next time you got to show us how to do yeah, this I exercise. Don't know about that. I don't know. We'll have to see about that. We might do. And what about What's you, the Anita? <laughs> what about you? What exercise do you do? Um, at the moment, I'm doing DVDs in the house, really. I've got about 10 DVDs that I swap over. Do you do like aerobics or you do um, Zumba? 
I don't do Zumba, no, no. I remember going along to a Zumba class once and I was absolutely atrocious at doing it. And really? Yeah, everyone dancing one way and I dance the other way. So, um, uh, no, but... Um, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> you probably went to a really advanced class. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but there are simpler Just, yeah. ones that are easier yeah. to learn. <laughs> and what about you, Promi? What is your well, exercise routine like? Mm, I start by just stretching. You know, yes. Just to get the muscles all loose, the yes. joints. Stretching is important. Very mm. important. And I saw you, you you sort of a breathing. Yes, it's important to breathe <laughs> properly. It's important, you know, you want to make sure that oxygen, fresh oxygen is actually getting into all your body cells so you're more relaxed. Yeah. And know? that's really key, isn't it, to have relaxing exactly. um, exercises as well as yes. the really hard core. Yes. 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 And you can do that while you're stretching as well because mm. you're opening up mm. all your, you know, your muscles, you know, yes. your joints. So I start with that and then... I go into like my jumping jacks, you know, planks, side planks, four planks, you wow. know. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, you know, a bit of waist movement, you know, just to keep a defined waist. Okay. You know, you can lose the... Yes. Love jiggles. Jiggles. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you do you know? marathons as well? Yes, I do my 10K. 10K? Yes. I tell my you, next time you're going, you need to take us. All of us, not just yes, myself. Yes, I think. Are you all volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it is, like, with exercise, like you stated, I mean, it could be, you know, um, boring. But you, what it is, you don't have to do it all in one hit. Yeah. You know, just a minimum of, you know, 30 minutes a day, but you can break mm -hmm. it up into yeah. small blocks, five minutes, and do it throughout the day. Yeah. You yes. know, so because obviously most of us are busy people. First thing in the morning, probably before you get kids ready for school. Stretch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's an exercise to suit that time of day exactly. as well. Exactly. Really important. Yeah. Yes, very important. Because everyone you know? is different. You gotta, you know, for me, I have wasted so much money in paying to go to the gym and I never go. Or I, I go for the first two weeks and then I, I make loads of adjusted. excuses. So for me, working out at home is better. I just need yeah, to motivate like myself a bit more yes, yeah. that's what I do. and I get out. Imagine. You know, because I also I'm a driver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, sometimes, you know, it's quicker to just drive, but I'm learning, you know, I'm putting it into Take, practice. Exactly. Take a walk Everything. instead. Yes. So I do, I do that in the evening. I usually like um, having a walk in my um, nearby park. That's yeah. really good. It, it's really nice. Yeah. And sometimes I take a book with me and mm -hmm. read. But yeah, I I'm working on the exercise. A lot of people, when they go on a holiday as well, they want to have relaxing time. They mm -hmm. don't realize mm -hmm. we can actually incorporate exercise into that holiday as well. Of course. Yeah. So running along the beach, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like that and swimming yeah. as well. As you can do swimming that is very, very good. Non-holiday times as well as on holiday. Yeah. So but we can, do, we can do a lot of things indoors as well course. as outdoors. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what can we all do to raise awareness of stroke survivors and prevention? Well, at the moment, I'm um, volunteering for the Stroke Association mm -hmm. in media, actually. So I'm doing the social media, which I absolutely love because oh, I'm nice. obviously an Instagram and a Twitter babe now for, for this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing PR and media. So that, that's really, yeah. So... Well, you just being here today is also creating greater awareness mm -hmm. of stroke yeah. because a lot of people still think, I'm too young. I'm too young to get a stroke. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's the that's uh, mentality a lot of people have. I'm too young to get sick. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite odd. Um, you know, when I suffered the stroke, obviously, I was thought that I was the youngest person that ever sort of thing because you, you don't think that will ever happen yeah. to you at such, you know, stroke is... For older people that's what yeah. i would always mm. thought anyway yeah and now i've got loads of friends who are stroke survivors and stuff like that which yeah. is yeah it's really yeah. inspirational to me as well really to, yeah so you've met a lot of younger people oh yeah yeah over the last wow. five years i've met so many stroke survivors um obviously um in terms of my spacer class but also from the stroke association mm. from um um, Connect, which um, used to be um, a, a place for um, aspasia people to, to come and I dro used to drop in there and um, okay. so that was quite nice as well. I've met a lot of friends from there as well, mm, which is really, nice. yeah. Okay. That's brilliant because yeah. it can be quite devastating for anyone, especially when they're younger, to have a stroke. Yeah. And if they don't have that network of support around them, say on the same age group as well, yeah. um, that they can relate to, 
it's quite difficult to overcome that psychological barrier of thinking you can't do anything else going forward in the future. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I also think that you know people should. Um, they need bite-sized information that can be put in leaflets. Yes, where exactly. you can hand them. You know, at, you know, your local grocery stores. You know, the yeah. gym. Yeah. You know, cinema, petrol stations, where people can get easy access yes. mm-hmm. because. You don't really think about this, and just like you stated, I mean, you were quite young. No one would be thinking of stroke at yeah, that age, no. yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. But if people are made aware, yeah. you know, of this, you know, your lifestyle, you know, mm. smoking, yeah. how much yes. alcohol you're taking, mm. is your lifestyle is it sedentary, yeah. you know, if you just have that at the back of your mind, you know, mm-hmm. it gets you thinking. Yeah, it's not just affecting if it affects them. Exactly. Stroke, but also if it affects their loved ones or their friends, exactly. they know what to look out for yes. immediately and the yeah. quicker they can work to you know, take them to the hospital, the, yeah. the better for that person. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much ladies for joining us and sharing your story with our viewers. Really appreciate and creating okay. greater awareness about stroke strategies and what we need to do to prevent and to cope with such. Yeah. Recovering after a stroke, it's not easy, but you can. You can overcome, you can get through this. Support is available, there is help available. There are various organizations out there that can help you throughout this process. Today's topic, you know, makes you be more aware of what we can do as well to prevent this from happening by taking better care of our health, taking better care of ourselves, by paying greater attention to what we eat what we do, how we think in terms of getting sufficient sleep, taking care of our mental and physical health. Today you've heard our thoughts on how to cope with stroke and the strategies that are in place. So you've heard our thoughts, let's hear from you on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or by emailing comments at dkw.me. Join us next week for another inspiring and informative episode of DKW. Until then, it's goodbye.